country's history to commit violence on black people. That's it. This is part of our identity. And so we, we have to continue to try to change the mentality. How we get there, I really don't know, but we are, we are fighting to get there. We really are because we have put too much into this country to, to give it up. You know, we are the part of the strong foundation of this country. So anyway, good to see you, Keila. Thank you, okay. Angela. I am, in case anyone didn't know, and we are worldwide, I am supporting Akila Weber for the 79th seat. Not as want everybody to know that. <laughs> I know the press release you went heard out. It, you heard it here, the endorsement of, of Council Member Monica Montgomery. <laughs> Right and here I appreciate Women it. Color War show. Thank you, and uh, we will see you soon. And on Happy Black Future Month. Happy Black Future Month. See you. Hi, Monica. Time. Well, so uh, Dr. Akila Weber, welcome to the show. Uh, this is the show that where we have conversations you won't hear anywhere else. <laughs> We're literally in my living room, <laughs> so, but I, I, I wanted to have you on the show uh, for a long time. There were, you know, uh, I know that you are um, a physician and uh, that you, now you work in, uh, is it pediatric gynecology? Is that, is that the area? Could you tell I'm an OB. Could you, so tell me a little bit about, about your medical background. So I am an OBGYN. I did my uh, residency at Cook County Hospital in Chicago. And then I did a fellowship after that. Um, I was very lucky at the time to receive one of two fellowships in the country. There was only two positions in the country and I got one of them um, to learn about pediatric and adolescent gynecology. And so that's what I, I do, that's what I am. I uh, founded the Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology Division at Rady Children's Hospital here in San Diego. But I also have my adult OBGYN practice through UCSD. So I deliver babies, I do surgeries, and I take care of girls from birth through death. Now, I, an interesting thing about your uh, bio, I saw that you graduated at, from medical school at 26. Did you, yes. did, you, did you graduate from high school early? I mean, how did, how did you get it done so quickly? I just kept going. You know, I did, um, you know, I didn't take any, any breaks. Uh, I went to Xavier in New Orleans and they told us no breaks at the time, just keep going. Cause they wanted to make sure that, you know, for those who were interested in medicine that we actually got in and finished that, that nothing else deterred us. So I finished college at 22, entered med school at 22 and four years later, I graduated with my medical degree. That's excellent. Well, that of course begs the question then, why do you want to go into, into public service and, and particularly um, run for the, the assembly seat when you already have a, a, a practice as a physician? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, healthcare is an aspect of public service. That's what we do. Uh, we are here to serve the community and ensure that um, our patients and our community become healthier and stronger. And for those of us who um, work within the healthcare profession, we understand that medicine and having a healthy community is more than what goes on in clinics and more than what goes on in the operating room. There's a lot that happens before, and we call those the social determinants. So, you know, when you come in, are you too concerned about whether or not you have food insecurity? Do you have a place to live? First off, do you even have access to good quality healthcare in your area? Um, is there an issue with academics with either you or your children? All of these things play into one's health. Racism, systemic racism. There's a, been a lot of talk about um, the fact that Black women are three to five times more likely to die or have a significant outcome um, once they are pregnant. It has nothing to do with your social economics. It's all about race. It has everything to do with the microaggressions that we all deal with on a daily basis. And so if you are in healthcare, then you know that in order to have a healthy community, that you need to work to help tackle all of those other things. And I've done some of those in La Mesa, and that's why I ultimately decided to run for the 79th. So tell me, what if, what if you feel that you were able to accomplish in La Mesa? Because after, you know, what happened at, high, um, at Helix High School, uh, all of our attention suddenly went to La Mesa. So, so tell me a little bit about, has anything changed in La Mesa? Since then? Oh, a lot 
has changed in La Mesa. And like I said, that for me was really what made me decide to run. Um, I went to the town hall after that event happened. Actually, both of them, I spoke. Um, and I watched our city council was being very dismissive to what was being said by the residents and more importantly, what was being said by the students who had taken time either scheduled to come and talk about the things that were going on at Hewitt. And I looked and I said, you know, there is no diversity up there in terms of racial background, but there's also no diversity in terms of thought process. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were um, attorneys. None of them had any children under the age of 15 at the time. And so they were very deaf at that time and sometimes very defensive to what was being said. And so I decided to run. And when I ran, I said, I'm gonna do a few things. I'm gonna make sure that the residents understand and that we more importantly understand as public officials that we are there to serve them, that we have an open door policy, that we work on transparency and communication. And we've done that. And I mean, it's like a completely different council and mayor, even though some of the people are the same players on there, just the way in which we interact and that we get the information out and we're getting ready to actually hire a communication specialist to improve on that. Um, you know, and, and we've had issues for a, for a long time with the way our police officers, certain police officers have interacted with uh, members of our community, specifically black, black and brown. And those things have just gone under the rug, just kind of brushed under the rug as if they would just magically disappear. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but back in 2015, there was a judge here in the county that told La Mesa, hey, you need to develop a citizen's police oversight review board. And our mayor, who's still our current mayor, and he's changed his thinking uh, recently, but he wrote a letter back on behalf of the council and said, no, we don't need one. And then we had the situation that happened in 2018 and nothing happened, right? So um, one of my goals was to really work with the community, work with the council um, and make sure that we did establish one. It was not easy, you know, there's a, there was definitely a lot of pushback. But I was very happy that I could be there to give them that voice to say, we cannot continue to ignore this. This is an issue even here in La Mesa. We need to fix it and we need to do it so that we provide more transparency, more accountability, um, and that we are able to develop a community that is welcoming to everyone to either live, visit, or have a business. And so, you know, we have finally our police oversight um, task force. We've seated our members. It's a very diverse group. Um, the mayor and I chose the member. And so, um, yes, yes. So, you know, we definitely diverse in racial and thought process and gender. And, um, and I'm very excited that they will be able to work in our community, work with our police department, work on some of our policies and procedures to make sure that they are updated um, and best practices, especially things like our use of force policy. Um, and, you know, and, and, the, and let the residents know that there is a way that you can voice your concerns about whatever is going on or, or if you've had a, an encounter with a police officer um, without fearing for any kind of retribution. You know, this obviously is, uh, is Black History Month and, you know, many of us um, have strong mothers. And my mother was an entrepreneur, and um, and I know people in San Diego don't know, but my mother actually is from Trinidad. She had her own beauty salon. She made hair products and uh, came to America, and I ended up having a, a hair product line of my own. So, you know, what I learned from her, I was able to take it on, and it's like a, a passed-on legacy of having the experience of a mother who was entrepreneurial and I knew I could start my own business and I could what I could do and I learned about about the hair care industry now obviously um you know we know that that uh, Dr. Shirley Weber is your mother and but what was it like growing up in a home with with Dr. Weber as your mother well I was very fortunate to grow up in the home with two amazing parents unfortunately my father has passed away but he was extremely active as well within the San Diego community. He was president of the NAACP, um, very active in the Earl B. Gilliam Bar Association, very instrumental in getting black judges seated here in San Diego County. Um, and so growing up in an environment where you had two parents who um, really taught us the importance of giving back, the importance of, of advocacy. Um, you know, people are often shocked who didn't know me growing up to know that I, lived in Southeast San Diego. I went to Encanto Elementary. I went to Gompers Secondary for 7 through 12. 
um, and, and I went to church in the community because my parents felt that it was very important that their children understand and know where they come from and not to be taken out of the community and to make sure that we always give our resources back to the community. And so it was, it was very, um, it was an amazing experience to be able to be raised in that kind of environment and to, and to hear the, the things that are talked about at the dinner table um, and have them resonate within you, even if you're not even realizing at the time. I had to, um, a few nights ago, I had to get some stuff together for my son. He had to do some family history presentation. And I found this article on the NAACP website on my dad and I printed it out for him. And when I was reading through it, one of the things that they said that my dad fought for, and I didn't even remember this, was for um, Citizens Oversight Police Review Task Force. This was like 30, 40 years ago. And I was like, oh my goodness, it's, it's so amazing. But um, the, the, the values and the, and the things that they believed in and they fought for have definitely been ingrained in both myself and my brother. And these are the things that I'm ingraining in my children as well. Well, you know, the, the question, of course, that everyone has is because your mother, you know, has, was here in the 79 and obviously created an amazing legacy there, um, that for you to run for that seat, somehow, do you feel that you deserve to have the seat because your mother had it? But I want to give you an opportunity to, 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 to set the record straight of why you were running and, and, and whether or not you feel that, that that's fair for people to, to put on you? Well, you know, like I said, I, I am running because I live in this district. I was born and raised in this district. I'm actually now an elected official in this district. And I'm able to look around and see all the things that, that we need, that we need to continue to make sure that we have someone who is going to be able to go to Sacramento and fight on behalf of not only this district, but, but all Californians, all of those who don't necessarily have a voice. Um, I've done, I've been able to do some really good things here in La Mesa. I've been able to work across the aisle, get a lot of stuff done. Um, and, and I feel like those things would be good to be done throughout the entire state of California. I'm not running because my mom told me to run. I'm not running because I had any plan to run. Uh, I do think that there are less expensive ways of going into politics. You don't have to go the medicine route. Um, and so it, it definitely was not a part of my plan. But as things have unfolded, um, sometimes you realize that the path that you thought that you were going to be on is not necessarily the path that you are meant to be on. And like I said, when I talk about the social determinants of health, You've got to tackle education. You've got to tackle access to quality health care. Like I said before, I did my residency at Cook County, which is a county hospital in, in Chicago. I worked in Dallas at Parkland Hospital, which is their county hospital. I was shocked when I moved here, moved back home, and found out that we didn't have a county hospital. How is that even possible in a city the size of San Diego that we don't have a county hospital? that I would have patients come to me and I diagnose them with cancer and I cannot get them to the right doctor because either they don't have insurance or they don't have the right kind of insurance. That is reprehensible. And so looking at these things and knowing that I have a foundation of advocacy, foundation of social justice, I have two young boys myself that I am trying my best to provide the best education for. Those are the reasons why I decided to run. I think anyone who feels that they have something to give should run. And we'll see what the voters decide. You know, it's interesting, uh, you talked about <clears throat> access to health care, And California did lead on, on launching the Affordable Care Act here, Cover California. And I was very involved in that, that rollout. But <clears throat> where are we today? I know that we have, um, we have a lot of factions. Some people want to see Medicare for all. Uh, we have uh, President Biden who wants to strengthen the uh, Affordable Care Act. You know, he's opened back up open enrollment. Uh, what is your feeling about uh, Medicare for all? And should we go to a single payer system? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, I definitely think that the first thing that we all need to agree on is that quality health care is a human right. Just like your right to breathe, your right to have access to quality health care is a human right. 
And it is not something that should be denied. It is not something that you should go into debt for. It is something that should be accessible to everyone. And once we can come to that basic conclusion, then we can bring all of the parties together to figure out what the best way is to develop a single system to allow for that to happen. Well, what are, what are gonna be the initiatives that you champion? Let's say, okay, you're elected, it's a special election. So I believe um, that April we have, uh, what it's a primary first, and then we have the election in June. So how do you hit the ground running? What are the initiatives that you would put forth when you get there to Sacramento? Well, no, definitely focusing on healthcare, um, making sure that, like I was saying, that we have access to quality healthcare for, for all Californians, especially within the 79th district, we do not have access to good quality healthcare. And when I say that we also need preventative care because when we look at COVID and who it's impacting, it's because of a lack of preventative health care. So you talk about pre-existing medical conditions that put you at increased risk for having the either dying from COVID or having significant um, side effects, repercussions from COVID. That's diabetes, that's hypertension, it's you know obesity. Those are things that you could all deal with on a preventative me measure, but you don't ha necessarily have those specialists and access within our district. So definitely working on that. Education is extremely important to me. Every child should have access to early quality education. That means preschool, that means TK, because everyone should be on the same level. It should not matter which zip code you're in to determine the quality of your education. The achievement gap, we know that that is a huge gap between you know, African-Americans, uh, Latinos, and, and others. And unfortunately, what COVID has done is just continue to widen that gap because you have issues of uh, lack of internet access. You have um, issues with the different kinds of curriculum based on what school you go to um, during these times of COVID. So we're really gonna have to put some resources in, and focus on, on that. Social justice, continuing some of the things that my mom has done in those areas. You know, when we were just dealing with this situation in La Mesa, um, this most recent situation in La Mesa with the officer at the MTS station, um, one of the things that was very frustrating was the inability to do certain things that you know was right, but you had to really jump through hoops to get them done. And that is, and those things cannot be changed on a local level. Those things have to be changed um, at a state level. And then finally, you know, we've got to work on our economy. We've got to help out our small businesses because those really are the heart of our community. Um, so those are some of the, the things that I will be focusing on for the first, you know, first few legislative terms. Well, you know, honestly, most people really don't know what the assembly member does. So could you tell us a little bit about what is the role of the assembly member that represents our district 79? Mm -hmm. So the role of the uh, state assembly is to really uh, create laws that um, are enacted throughout the state. And um, so on a local level, you can do like ordinances, you can, you can focus on certain things, but it's in the state legislative body that really creates laws, determine where funding goes that come from the state and from other areas within the state or come from the, from the federal government and from other areas within the state. So it's extremely important to make sure that uh, that your representative who goes there um, is able to be an advocate for your needs, um, is able to get things done, and is able to work with others because it's it's not a it's not a singular thing. You've got to work with not only your other assembly, um, per, you know, people. You also have to work with the senate and you have to work with the governor as well. How has the community responded to your candidacy for this for this position? Overall, we've, we've they've. It, They've been very, very, very supportive. Um, I've been very, very grateful. Um, you know, the city of La Mesa has been uh, extremely supportive. I have the support of, um, you know, pretty much all of my fellow council members and the mayor. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of people within the 79th because I grew up here, knew me from when I was a kid, remember um, the things that I was doing at the time, and they're really excited. And I'm excited to be able to, to serve them. Well, now we've got a few minutes left in the show, and I wanted to hear from you. What is it that you want uh, 
the people that you're asking for, for their vote, what do you want them to know about you? Well, what I want them to know is that I am a member of this community. I represent this, a city in this community. My children live and go to school in this community. And I love this community. That's why I moved back. I moved back so that I can start to give back to the community that gave so much to me. I am who I am. I was able to go where I have gone in life because of the people who touched me right here in this community. And it is extremely important to make sure that, that we make sure to put this community and the people in this community first, that we have someone in Sacramento that is thinking of us and that when they are in front of the cameras and also when they're behind closed doors, they are fighting for us and our needs. And that is me. That is what I have done. I have a proven track record of it, and that is what I will continue to do. And it would be my honor to be able to serve you as your assembly member. And and how do you see us coming out of, uh, of this COVID pandemic? What do you think are the next steps? Well, once we're out, we really have to take a really good look to see what went wrong um, in, in the whole grand scheme of, of, of this pandemic um, and develop a plan so that this doesn't happen again. Um, one of our pitfalls was that we did not develop mass testing. Um, if we had mass testing, then people would not have to stay at home so frequently if you can just go get tested on a regular basis. And there are places that do that. I have colleagues whose kids are in, in college. They get tested every three days. I have to get tested every week. So that is possible. Um, and then two, make sure that we are developing a Christian system within education and the economy and pretty much every aspect of our life so that if we go through this again, it is not as devastating as it has been this time. Well, uh, Dr. Akila Weber, I appreciate you coming on the show today and you're welcome to come back because these Thank are you. ongoing conversations and, you know, yes. always breaking news and things for us to chime in. And, and I always want to get you know, a, a point of view of Black women elected officials on what's going on. And I want to thank you. And um, and how do people, uh, if they want to get involved in your campaign, what is your website? Uh, www.drakilaweber.com. All right. Thank you. This has been Women of Color Roar on February 6, 2021. It is Black History Month. Uh, we are saying we are calling it Black Future Month because we are laying the seeds for our future. And uh, it's been great to be with you today. And this is Angela DeJoseph signing off for Women of Color Roar. Have a great Saturday. Thanks, Angela.